Hello, my name is Chris Butch. I am a research scientist with the Blue Marble Space Institute of Science, the Earth Life Science Institute, and Emory University. And I'm going to talk to you today a bit about kinetic versus thermodynamic assemblies and how they are important in studying the origin of life. So to get started, it's important that we define some terms just to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, thermodynamics is the study that is concerned with the flow of energy between different states. So when something is thermodynamically stable, this refers to being in a state where it's low energy, there's no energy to be harnessed from going to a different state. Um, kinetics is the study of the rate of transition between different states. So kinetic stability refers to a state where transitions happen slowly. These aren't always the same, things can be thermodynamically stable and kinetically stable. They can be thermodynamically unstable and kinetically unstable, or they can be one or the other. To try to visualize this and show that it's somewhat intuitive, uh, at least in physical systems, what I have here is just a plot showing a few different states and how their thermodynamic and kinetic stability is related to each other. So our boulder here, balanced on a pillar, is thermodynamically unstable. There's a lot of energy to be released if that falls. But kinetically, it's pretty stable. It would take a lot of energy to disrupt that assembly. Our daredevil, balanced on a chair on top of a chair on top of a building, is in a thermodynamically and kinetically unstable state. It wouldn't take very much to cause him to fall, and falling would release quite a bit of energy. Uh, on the bottom right, this die on a flat surface is in a thermodynamically stable state. There's nowhere for it to go to release energy, but kinetically it's fairly unstable. You bump it a little bit, it'll go rolling across the table. And then finally, the shipwreck is both thermodynamically and kinetically stable. There's no energy to be released from it changing, and it's unlikely to change. So transitioning to the application to chemistry and the origin of life, how do we talk about this in terms of chemical states? Well, a simple way of looking at this is this type of diagram that I've shown here, where these lines represent different possible chemical states, and these can be uh, related to reaction products, or they can be related to molecules just binding to each other without actually forming a new chemical bond. And the energy of the state is just higher the higher it is on the slide. But then you also need to know something about how changes between these states can happen. And so here I've just drawn some lines connecting the states that show what is permissible. And so once you know about these transitions, then you can talk about the stability of the different states. On the leftmost side of the slide, we have a kinetically stable but thermodynamically unstable state. And the reason for this is because in order to exit this state, it has to go to a higher energy state which is kinetically and thermodynamically unstable before falling into the lowest energy state, which is kinetically and thermodynamically stable. If we were to have a transition between the leftmost and the rightmost states, then the leftmost state would no longer be kinetically stable because there would be no uphill barrier preventing it from transitioning, and it would just be kinetically and thermodynamically unstable. So why are we talking about these kinetic and thermodynamic assemblies? Well, it's because biomacromolecules, RNA, DNA, proteins, are kinetic assemblies in more ways than one. They are chemically kinetic assemblies because energy is used to polymerize amino acids and nucleic acids. Uh, these are driven by energy from phosphorylation, and then the polymerization is an uphill process. And so breaking these down releases energy. However, in the cell, they're stable, due to lack of reactivity, as well as structural conformations. They fold in on themselves, which both chemically and structurally stabilizes them. These 3D structures can be thermodynamic minima, but they often aren't. Typically, they're a local minimum that is kinetically stabilized because it would have to go through an uphill process in order to get out of it. Prion diseases are an example of this. Prion diseases involve an autocatalytic transition, meaning that once it occurs once, it is more common, from the native kinetic state to a more stable thermodynamic state. Looking at an example of the thermodynamics of a prion folding, uh, what you're seeing here is the folding of PRPC um, in, an in a graph similar to the simple one that I just showed you. 
the folding of the protein into its native state is shown in the red well here, and you can see that folding releases some energy, but it's not the lowest energy state overall. And so what this means is that that native state is kinetically stable, but thermodynamically unstable. And once it discovers this prion folding, these other states become available to it. And once you get into those prion states, they aggregate and they form plaques, which are in the lowest overall state. And this is why fighting prion diseases is so difficult, because once you've accumulated into these plaques, disrupting those is always going to be energetically uphill to try to get back to the native state. So this is a question in terms of the origin of life as well, only in reverse. When we're talking about the simple systems that can be produced without life, these uh, accumulations of molecules, the question of how they are driven from just thermodynamic reaction products to kinetic states that are more like folding RNA, folding DNA, folding proteins, is a question of how we drive from this thermodynamic state into a kinetic state. What I'm showing here is just a simple depiction of some work out of Dieter Braun's group, where they show that thermal gradients in a pore, which could be a pore in a mineral, uh, are capable of driving polymerization of nucleic acids to longer polymers. And like I said before, these polymers are, in a chemical sense, a thermodynamically unstable state. And then they are kinetically stabilized. And then we'd like to go even further and see kinetic folding into functional assemblies and exploration of those three-dimensional spaces. However, the important thing here is that this is a way of driving it from a thermodynamic state, these monomers, into this kinetic state of the polymer. And so that gets into open questions in the field, which is, well, are there environments that exist where production of these building blocks, production of amino acids, nucleic acids, would be favored thermodynamically, they would be favored as reaction products, but exploration of their sequence space is kinetically favored? so that they can polymerize and find new folds and find functional sequences. And in the desire to drive that process, how can chemical systems be created that can utilize environmental energy? That thermal energy in that pore is one example, but you could have chemical energy or solar energy driving chemical systems to form other kinetic assemblies. And so if you're interested in these open questions, uh, I would suggest that you take a look at this paper by Addy Pross and Bob Pascal on how and why kinetics, thermodynamics, and chemistry uh, influence biological evolution. Uh, you can check out work by uh, Semenov et al., which is similar but not completely the same in that they're looking at reaction networks and uh, discovering kinetically stable but thermodynamically unstable reaction networks or this paper by Addy Pross on how can chemical systems act purposefully and how you can do this bridge between non-life and life, this transition from thermodynamics to kinetics.